From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy. The Vitamins. The Energy. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Vitamin Energy coming up on today's show, bracing for a cyclone and possibly changes if the offense doesn't get any better. Billy Embody from the SMU website on On3 here to break the Mustangs down. And is Florida State actually maybe kind of close on offense to getting this thing turned around? Wake Up War Champ presented by Vitamin Energy, vitaminenergy.com, promo code WordChamp, BOGO, WordChamp, B O G O. Buy one, get one free. Vitamin Energy's got 260 milligrams of all-natural caffeine in one little bitty bottle. You can take it anywhere. The gym, your clutch, your Merce, satchel, whatever you want to call it, gentlemen. Take it wherever you go. Take it before you work out. Take it before you start your day at the office. No wrong time to take it. I was looking forward to popping one during a live show this week, Corey, but I think uh, Helene is going to throw a wrench into our plans for partying this week here in Tallahassee. Fingers crossed everybody in harm's way. Vitaminergy.com, though. I'm, I'm probably going to need the mood. I'm going to go over to my neighbor's house, I think. Maybe I'll just leave a note in the mailbox. But, hey, man, I'm leaving town. If you could just text me a photo of what has crashed through my house on Friday morning, yeah. I'd appreciate it. Um, and that's how I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cope with it. And I'm going to take lots of mood plus uh, to uh, salve, alleviate the pain of losing my humble abode here, probably. Anywho, let's talk football. Wordchant.com, ultimate seminal sports source, FSU1. Gets you two months for $1. What are you waiting for? They just won a football game, everybody. If they win on Saturday, that would be two in a row. Maybe a streak, some might yeah. call it. Yeah. Um, I call this guy the Coracle. He sees all, knows all. It's Corey Clark, everybody. Lead writer, senior writer for Wordchant.com. Coming off a busy, busy Tuesday for our guy, here, though, ready to create content for everybody out there. How are you, Corey? I'm great, buddy. I'm great. How are you doing? I hope everybody's staying safe out mm. there. Uh, we don't usually get – we get bumped by a lot of hurricanes, right? We get – we get uh, we feel the effects of hurricanes in Tallahassee. We don't normally have Cat 3s that just roll into Tallahassee, mm. like straight on into Tallahassee. Yeah. So that's what we're kind of looking at uh, for now as we're recording this. So I just – again – Want to reiterate, we hope everybody stays safe, and if you can get out of the way of this thing and have the means and want to, like Aslan and I, uh, please go do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, people always like, oh, it's the big one. It's like, well, I don't know if it's the big one or not, but it's just it's seemingly we're we're in the we're in the the strike zone. You know, we're yeah. we're on, and this thing is coming on the black, and uh, it's strong. And there's so many trees in this town, so many trees, so many old trees. Yeah. Just ready to collapse at just even the most uh, brisk of winds, let alone a uh, By the way, major storm. The, so I, I'm assuming, because you have a phone that works, that mm. you got that emergency notification whenever that was, like at 5.15 on Tuesday. <laughs> the one that said, like, catastrophic damage is imminent. Or not and it's imminent, blaring, but. and it's like, I get it. it. It's what a tornado warning should be. Oh, no, I don't no, – nothing audio went off, but I got my phone on silence. Oh, so no, mine went off, oh. and I, mine on silence too, but it buzzed and made a really loud, like, panic, mm. you know, one of those alarm sounds that they make. And I'm like, man, I, I feel like for a hurricane that's 36 hours out, yeah. we don't have to startle us <laughs> – to where we, we, we drop what we're drinking because our phone just exploded with sound. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought that, I think for it should be different. Like if a missile's incoming, like that 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 one for Hawaii when it was at four, three or four years ago, you remember that? Yeah. yeah. When the guy accidentally hit inbound missile <laughs> warning? That, that should, if a missile's coming at us, then yes, please, by all means, just make my phone as loud as possible. But when we, we, we're tracking the hurricane, we know what's coming. Maybe dial it down a little. That's all, that's all I'm saying because we're all tracking it anyway, and it doesn't hit for another. You know, by the time they did that, another 36 hours probably. All right, um, first world problems. Yeah, well, I, well, it's yeah, that's a significant problem. That's a significant yes. problem. Nonetheless, football season, we persevere. Everybody, Florida State taking on SMU Saturday night, 8 p.m. in yeah. Dallas, ACC Network. Listen to headlines again, Corey. I don't know why. It just um. What do you mean you don't know why? Because it's a great show. I do, but I, <laughs> it, I this says I guess a, a lot about who I am as a person. I just feel like when they lose, it's I'm I'm more dialed in. Like I, I feel like there's more meat mm. on the bone. Like when they win, it's like yeah, man, they're really good. 
The schedule's not great. They don't play in a great conference. They're talented than more talented supremely than everybody they're going to play. They're probably going to win next week. We'll talk to you then. But right. like you know, when you lose, for some reason I don't know. Just the discussion seems to have more breadth, more depth to it. As I mean, listen, I like celebrating wins. I'm not saying I don't like celebrating wins, but when it comes to talking about it, where it's not just. You keep tripping over yourself trying to one-up the other guy about, oh, this is great. Oh, but this is even better. Well, what about this? They look amazing. Uh, that's first-world problems. I don't know, just something about um, being, the, being in the trenches together, struggling, feeling the pain. Right. You guys uh, But Aslan, they won on Saturday, so what are you talking about? They're, <laughs> they're, they won this week. It was a winning show. We yeah. got to talk about a win. There was no angst at all. Ira tried. Oh, boy, Mama yeah. Ira tried. Uh, trying to pull you guys on the right side of things. So... To, to sum it up, I guess I don't want to spoil it. Go download and listen to seminal, seminal, listen to seminal headlines. But on our program here on Monday, we kind of talked about it, if not now, when for Brock Glenn. Right. So Ira's theory is that DJ Uwe Ungale in Mike Norvell's mind probably just gives him a little bit better of a chance to win a football game than Brock Glenn does at this point. To which you sort of counter... Well, at this point, they're the 126th offense in the country. They're terrible. So if he's giving you a better chance to win right now, then that says the odds are very slim of Brock being able to take over at some point here in the um, future that we can see with something besides binoculars. But he's like, well, hey, that's bridge too far. I won't go that far. But yeah, I don't put words in his and it's it, it, you know his point is fair. It's valid that you know quarterbacking is different. People do grow leaps and bounds with with uh well whether more experience, more practices, you know whatever. Um, and he's also a redshirt freshman, so it's it's too early uh, in his mind and my mind too, quite honestly, to just completely give up on Brock Glenn. But I can understand a side of the fan base that thinks, man, if he can't play now then clearly he's not going to be ready. If he can't play right now for this offense, so just give it a jolt, then obviously he isn't the guy for 2025. So who is? Yeah. Um, and that's what I kept trying to bring the conversation back to. Not necessarily, It's not really, not necessarily a referendum on Brock Glenn, whether he can be a competent or good or great college quarterback or not, but like, w- what answers are you going to have December 1st when you start putting together this roster? Because you've got to put together a roster for 2025, and I know we still got nine games left in this season. No, sorry, eight um, left left in this season, and there's still some wins to be had out there, and maybe they can turn it around. But you know, and and I I, I don't know if that's Mike Norvell's. No, it's certainly not his uh, primary concern now. Is who's going to be his quarterback in 2025? But it needs to be a big concern. I, it, it needs to be a big focus. Like, okay, we've got to figure out – there's a lot of them, too. Like, it's not just the quarterback. Clearly, it's not just one player. It's There's a lot that went wrong into this failure that is this offense in 2024. But he's got to know who his quarterback is. You've got – you can't go in to another season uh, breaking in a quarterback that may not be any good. You can't do it. Not coming off three and nine or four and eight or whatever it ends up being. So that's why these next eight games of my – opinion are so vital to 2025 and if you don't think that Brock Glenn can do it which clearly right now again like I said yesterday if 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 he doesn't play against SMU quit asking why Mike Norvell won't play him Mm. it's it's obvious he doesn't think he's ready to run this offense in a way that's even better than 15 points a game so if that's the case in two months, it seems uh, it seems like a, a long shot that he is then going to be ready to take over the program. So that means it's either Luke or it's uh, – and I'm saying if this doesn't happen, if he doesn't play this year, uh, are any meaningful reps and they stay with DJ and it still keeps continues to look like slop, well then you've got to figure out who's your quarterback in 2025. No way are we, are we uh, selling our stock or think that Luke Cromanhawk isn't the guy. But we don't know. So do you lose? Do you use the Charleston Southern game and even the Florida game, any game, to see what Luke Cromanhawk is? Mm. Maybe not Clemson. That's not fair. Just like it wasn't a great spot for Brock Glenn to have to go play Louisville and Georgia. Probably wouldn't be fair for Luke Cromanhawk to play against um, uh, Clemson. Correct. Or but every game after that, maybe not Miami either. But after that, just you you've got to see what you've got. You've got to see what you got because. You have options if you don't like what's on your roster. 
Yeah, just it, it's kind of funny how it coincides with Oklahoma benching their starter and going to a younger guy. Uh, SMU benching their starter and going to a younger guy. And not necessarily in, in bad positions, SMU. I mean, SMU was 2-1. and one. They had a bye week. They didn't like the way they looked offensively. I mean, and this guy, the Preston Stone kid, this is like a third legacy SMU guy, uh, one of the highest rated high school prospects they've ever recruited. Uh, had a pretty decent year last year, helped them almost sneak in and, and win uh, and get a uh, at-large bid into a, a, a New Year's Six Bowl. And like they're they're only two and one, and they use their bye week. Like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna kind of change everything up here, pull the plug plug on him, put this new guy in, and you know, put up you know forty something points on offense against TCU, which is you know, yeah, it's still TCU, but it's not that bad. I think you see, obviously, you know, Michigan announces it to the world, like, hey man, we're we're pulling the plug on this guy. We're gonna go with Alex Orgy. Uh, you see it pay off against Southern Cal. So you know, these are young guys who have been given opportunities and taking the most, taking advantage of it. So you know. I don't think it's asking for the world for a kid that's been here now for, you know, 16 months. Maybe that's maybe on the short end of it. Uh, figure it out, man. Like, put him in the game. I mean, like, but at the same time, I also understand that we're at practice and there were some moments, you know, I think when they started off period three, I don't remember DJ doing anything of consequence. Meanwhile, Brock comes in and had a nice connection downfield to Darion Williamson. But it's just one period in one day in one week of practice. But maybe if he puts something together today at Wednesday's practice, sure. then maybe that starts opening the door. I do wonder if how much of it's going to be, you know, we talk about if it's fair or not to put Luke in these sort of games. But like, is it fair to, to put Brock in the middle of a game where they're losing and, and try to have him rescue you? Or, you know, isn't it easier, more fair to have him start a game? But obviously that's kind of moot because DJ is going to start. So I yeah. guess let's get behind DJ. Maybe he won't be as domed up. He won't be as stressed out. I'm sure that never came across Dabo's desk. Like, hey, maybe we just need to calm him down a little bit. Right. We'll, well, it maybe out. maybe being on the road will help him. I, I do yeah. think there's, you know, for him, the way this season has started and the booze, I, I think there's more pressure and more weight on DJ um, at home than on the road. Uh, so maybe he can play more freely on the road where it's like us against them. We're, we're, not, we're underdogs finally. We, no, we got nothing to lose. Maybe he'll let it rip and play a little more carefree. Um, yeah, sure, man. I mean, there's there's options. I mean, I'm not options, but there's there's paths where you think it can get better. SMU was not a good defense, and uh, you did, you know, funnily enough, you looked as good on offense as you have all season, in my opinion, for some stretches of that game against the best defense you've seen all season. You were able to run the ball a little bit, so maybe it does turn around to the extent that you can become below average instead of awful. And if you become below average on offense, well, there's a path to get to a bowl, right? There's right. a pa if you can go average 25 to 28 points oh, the yeah. rest of the season, With this you can get to a bowl. Yeah. yeah um, so maybe that's something that Mike Norvell still thinks is there. Um, you know, it, in when 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 you hear us and, and you know I even admit it, we all we all admit it. We we think he should have gone to Brock uh, two games ago, at least at halftime of the Memphis game. Right. But it, uh, anybody that's out there at practice, it's not as if Mike Norvell isn't seeing something. It's, it's not as if Brock Glenn is just lighting it the F up. Mm. And he's just doing – he's just – he's you know, he's Mike Norvell is just uh, obstinate and stubborn and wants to play his guy, quote-unquote. No, man. Brock Glenn is not outplaying DJ in practice in any way, shape, or form. We've made this point over and over, and I want to make that abundantly clear. It is not as if it is a humming machine when Brock Glenn is taking, taking snaps or making throws. It's 7-on-7 or 11-11, 1-on-1. He, he has not been as good as DJ. Um, so the argument we make for why Brock Glenn could play is is absolutely and only because he moves better. Mm. And, you know, that's that's what he has to – now that's a white flag of a, a reason. Like you're surrendering that your offense is so bad that you've just got to, like, kind of start playing backyard football and just like, i got to put a guy in that can run around a little bit and maybe make some plays. Like that's where you are. Uh, but, you know, I kind of feel like that is where you are. Like, look, look at the numbers, man. Look at the results. Your offense is terrible. But, you know, look, so I think moving forward, we, we can have this conversation for the rest of the season. It's already tiresome, right, guys? Right, like, yeah. it's tiresome. Um, the, 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 the conversation to have is what is going to be the quarterback situation in 2025? And also, is he willing, if, if they go, if they finish the season averaging under 20 points per game, that's Iowa bad. That's 
probably worse than Iowa was last year. I mean, they're they're in less than Iowa territory right now. So when you're that bad, there 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 should be drastic repercussions. You don't just run it back with the same coaching staff, or more more importantly, maybe you don't run it back with the same scheme. So is he going to Willie? Is it going to be so bad at the end of this year? Now we're only a month in, so things could turn around. Maybe they average twenty eight points over the next eight games, um, not counting Charleston Southern. But if if it gets so bad, would they would they finish one hundred and twenty eighth in the country in scoring and total offense and every other stat? Do you hire yourself an offensive coordinator that actually brings in his own offense, and you just delegate that to him and you become the head coach? Is that on the table? Oh, man. I, is that on the table? Because it is so bad, Aslan, that I think everything is on the table. Listen, and Mike's – sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to well, I was going to say, in the, in the thing we talked about that Jeff brought up, which I think is a good point, is that's the reason so, for so much consternation and so much real – worry and angst in this fan base it's not just that the record is one and three i mean people have bad starts uh, it's that it you there's mike mike norvell is considered an offensive genius or at least an offensive coach that has had some great offenses that's why he's here because of what his offenses were doing uh, and he has the worst offense in the country so there's Houston's no way worse don't be dramatic houston's Sorry. worse is it really i think so i think they're the Houston's, I think, the lowest scoring offense in power. Oh, play. sorry. My apologies, Cougars. Um, you're the worst. But uh, well, that's crazy. Well, let, Golly, me, they let, lose, me, let me triple uh, check what, that, by the way. Let me they lose what's-his-name? Holkerson, and they're the worst offense in the country. But it's yeah, a first-year coach. Yeah, it's Fritz. Yeah, bring, yeah, They're 129th. Florida State's 126th. And the, so. But that's a first-year coach, right? Maybe. Yeah, and their first yeah. year in the power yeah. four. So, so uh, that's a little more excusable than what, what is going on currently in Tallahassee. So, if – the point being, like, there's, there's no way that, uh, there's no way that a Lane Kip in offense would be this bad. Correct. There's no way that a Kirby Smart defense would be giving up 44 points per game. A Ryan Day no, offense would not be this bad. No matter what the personnel is, and now we can make arguments about Georgia and Ohio State and some uh, resources they have that Florida State doesn't. But if you think your coach is on par with those guys, and he certainly paid like it. Mm then you can't then be okay with this. And I'm not saying that the Florida State administration is or Mike Norvell is, but I know Kirby Smart wouldn't have a defense that gave up 48 points a game. No chance. And so Florida State, yes, he doesn't have great – he doesn't have a great – as Ira put it, he doesn't have a great hand to work with. But it's not a 2-7. He's got, he's got 10-8 suited. He's got something where if the flop win a certain – like his players aren't awful. I don't know, man. He picked this roster, man. He That's what I'm saying. Roster, exactly so. right. So he deserves all the blame. Yeah. And I feel like so much of the last month has been solely directed at DJ because he's the face of the change, right? Yes. He's the face of the new offense. It's the same offensive line for the most part. It's the same coaching staff. It's the same coach. Um, so, some of the same running backs. Same play <clears> caller, so, man. Yeah, so the change – is uh, the face of that change is DJ. So he bears the brunt of the responsibility when in reality it was a failure much higher than him. It was a systemic failure that has made this offense what it is. And when you have failures this bad, this is not going from ninth in the country to 44th in the country in offense. It is going from whatever they were before Jordan got hurt, I'm going to guess top 20 offense, to, you know, like we said, other than Houston, the worst in the country. Like, uh, uh, impossibly bad. So uh, that's why I think everything could be on the table, and that's why he's got to look and make sure – he's got to figure out what happened here. He's got to figure out what happened here, and gosh darn it, he needs to go get himself a quarterback that fits his system. Like, whatever that takes, what, however you can figure that out. If it's Luke Cromanhawk, it's Luke Cromanhawk. If it's Brock Glenn, it's Brock Glenn. If it's somebody in the portal, figure it out, man, because you can't, you can't just stand pat and bring everything back and bring the same system back and the same play caller and, and just the quarterbacks that are on your roster that can't play right now and think that fans are going to be really excited and fired up about what you're going to bring them in 2025. Like they've lost trust in not him as a head coach necessarily, but I think legitimately they've lost trust in his um, ability to evaluate and put together a competent offense because that's how bad it's been through four games. Uh, real quick, DJ Ui Unglele, best completion percentage of the year on the road, 70.4%. Took the least amount of sacks he has all season long also on the road. So maybe there is some validity. Merit what are you talking about, last year? No, this year. This year. What? 
Oh, in Dublin, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was thinking more about like a true road game where like uh, they're yeah. they're getting booed. Like that was more of a Florida State home game in yeah, Ireland. Yeah. Uh, this this will be like they'll feel like the road team. Yeah. I think I would assume. Um, and oh. so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he handles that. Uh, Iowa averaged fifteen point four points per game last year. That was one hundred twenty ninth in the country. Oh, my so they're averaging less than Iowa, dude. Yeah. Um, but back to the point about everything being on the table in terms of everything besides replacing the head coach, which nobody's advocating for. And I'm not certainly brand. advocating yes. for that nobody's, at all. Nobody's. I, I love what he's done for this program. It's been a lot of fun to watch this thing rise up. It's just, yeah, I don't want people to get it misconstrued that I'm, I'm calling for his job because I'm not, and that's not a possibility anyway. I guess, you know, Ryan Day was going to hire Bill O'Brien as his OC. He did, but then Bill O'Brien took the head job, and then he went and got Chip Kelly. But I, I wonder how much of those guys that make that amount of money, I think other than like Dabo. So it feels like you're going, you got two sort of, you got a fork in the road here, whereas if you delegate and you give up your style of offense to a, a, a play caller, you're either going to be Jimbo giving things up and having Bobby Petrino come in, which didn't work out great, or maybe go like Dabo in like 2011, I think is when he hired Chad Morris. And that was the first of however many years in a row, 12, 11 years of, of them winning 10 plus games. I think the difference, though, though, is that Dabo was never an OC. He's never called plays. He was a wide receivers right. coach. Yeah. He was a GA and then a wide receivers coach and then the head coach. Like, it's hard for these guys that are play callers. And they, the reason Mike Norbell makes $10 million a year is because of what he's been able to do with the offenses he's coached over the last 15 years. Right. And so it's very hard on an ego and on pride in to, to just then say, after one bad year, I'm giving it all up. I'm bringing somebody else's uh, vision in here, and I'm just going to be the head coach. That's That's got to be hard for him. I feel like that's At drastic, too, even if they have, end up being this bad, core. I mean, personally, I just that would be crazy because I don't know what is he. What else? What are you paying him $10 million or for? He's, he's not an elite recruiter. Um, if he's not going to be calling the plays, I don't know if he's done enough over the course of his year as like a game manager CEO to be like, all right, that's cool. That's a good role for him. And then we'll pay $2.5 million to somebody to coordinate the offense. Like, I, I just don't know if, if you even have that much data to go by thinking that that's a good pivot. Yeah, just uh, yeah, I don't, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not advocating that he can do that, but I do think if it gets if it's so bad, um, he might. You know, you could look around the country and see all these other offenses. Like literally, the anybody, any offense that you see, Memphis's coordinator, who's that? Go get him, Tim Cramsey. Go get him. Nah, like literally, and I'm not saying best. I'm saying that's something you could consider if you just if 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 he's at a loss for what happened. If he's got no real uh, rational expl explanation for what happened and why it's so bad, if he doesn't feel like he has the real answers, well, it could be a turning point in his career to admit that. And I'm not saying he he, he does, but you know these you know Nick Saban did eventually give up the offense to the defense to Kirby Smart. Well, he gave like, up he gave up the offensive identity of being smash mouth and running right. the ball by hiring. And Lane then Kiffin. he started he started. Well, he started. He was still doing pretty well yeah. before that. But they started winning uh, probably the same number of games, but they were more fun to watch. Um, and so they started winning Heismans, let's put it that way. Right. Um, and, and they have first-round picks at quarterback. So that that was different. That was fun. But I, I think that Norvell, it'll be interesting, man. And, yes, that is drastic. And it's probably too drastic for him to do. But the year is so bad, Aslan, if it, if it continues down this route, that I think yeah. – he could he could look around the country or his bosses, and I know he makes more money than anybody at the university. He still has bosses. Could could sit him down and be like, what what exactly? How what's your plan to fix this? Is it because we know it's not just a quarterback situation? So what exactly happened? Line by line, what happened for this uh, failure? This this um, you know historical failure on an offense, and and why won't it happen again? Like you know what I mean? I think that's something that that absolutely uh, should be discussed. I think it's fair. Um, I think the thirteen and zero season was awesome. I think the nineteen straight wins was great. But you know when you when you bounce back from that with this, I think it's it's uh, it's it's completely fair to ask him what why why how are you going to fix this? And don't just tell me you're going to fix it. Break it down for me. What are you going to do? What are your options? What are your because they could look, man. They could go get. There, there are going to be 125 coordinators in this country that will have a better season than Florida State's coordinator had this year. 
So, in play caller, in offense of a designer. So, you know, theoretically, you could go get all of them. You could go ask all of them to come for you, come play, come coach for you. But is he willing to give that up? The answer is probably a big giant no. What's a big giant yes is hanging yes, out in the corner pocket bar and Good grill, job, everybody, Aslan. taking advantage of all the great social things on the calendar as well as the daily lunch specials on Wednesday. Five-piece chicken wings and french fries, only eight ninety nine. Big, juicy, tender chicken wings. Best in town. They'll throw them around in a sauce of your choice, obviously. So many sauce options. It's crazy. I'd read them, but we'd be here for like another hour. Can't go wrong with any of them. But I'm just a buffalo medium guy. Just keep it real. That's what made these things popular and famous in the first place. It was a chicken wings and buffalo sauce. We're going to keep riding that till the wheels come off. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, 2475 Appalachia Parkway, cptallybar.com, the website. And um, not sure if they're going to have bingo at 7 p.m. on Thursday, everybody. I'm going to guess probably not, no. but check the Facebook page to mm. see if they're open. I assume if they have power. Well, no. Isn't that right when the hurricane's supposed to be hitting? Yeah, Around probably. Around evening yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Bill, I love you. <laughs> I, I love Corner Pocket. You know that. I'm there all the time. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell people to go to trivia on Thursday night if it's a, if a hurricane is hitting uh, Tallahassee at the time. So we're not we're not going to do that. But Friday and Saturday, assuming everybody in the city has power, a corner pocket has power, it's going to be a great place to go. Uh, you know, go watch football. Hmm. They've got Miami and uh, don't they Miami Virginia Tech on Friday That's night? Right. Go watch that at corner. Oh, pocket. was it Friday night? Nice. Yeah, and it's a great place to watch the Knolls on Saturday, especially if you don't have power or cable. Go watch, uh, go watch uh, the Knowles at Corner Pocket at eight o'clock. Well said. Uh, by the way, it's Bill Embody, Corey. It's Bill Embody. Oh, you got it. Okay, yeah. all right, good. From the SMU site, he's going to talk about the ponies. Corey and I will be back to talk more about the Knowles. But first, this was one that I had circled on the calendar. Everybody, I was really excited. I'm like, man, Aslan's first time in the Big D. SMU's first game in the ACC. Uh, but Florida State couldn't hold up our end of the bargain. And then, you know, SMU lost to BYU early in the season, too, but they've kind of bounced back. Uh, we'll see just how tough they will be. And for that, we'll bring in Billy Embody uh, from the SMU website here on On3 on the PonyExpress.com. Billy, thanks for taking time out. And how's life uh, covering the Mustangs right about now? Yeah, for this Florida native, it's great out in Dallas. You know, it's pretty hot, uh, just like Florida, but uh, all things are heating up around the Mustangs after last week's win against TCU. That one will always put a smile on SMU fans' faces for sure. Yeah, the Iron Skillet, man. I We had Elijah Roberts on the show at ACC kickoff, and we do like a, a fun little speed round of questions to end things out. And I'm like, what's the TCU-SMU rivalry game called? And he's like, I, I, I'm like, the Iron Skillet, man. Um, but, you know, he's, he's not totally initiated, but he's been a great player for uh, SMU last season, also uh, coming on strong this year. SMU sits at this game three and one again, Billy heading into ACC play. It, it seems like there might have not been a team that took better advantage of the off week as much as Rhett Lashley and the Mustangs did. What do you think they did so well uh, that helped prepare them for that TCU game and, and moving forward? You know, I don't want to say that you lose a game and it's a good thing, but I, I do think this team needed a little bit of a wake up call. You know, they, they, for whatever reason this year came out flat in multiple games, they're, Defense has been playing well, but they're not, as a team, going into that TCU game, they were not at a point where they should be feeling good about themselves overall, you know, especially offensively. And that's when they kind of hit the reset, I think, offensively. They named Kevin Jennings the starting quarterback, replaced Preston Stone, who was a blue chip SMU legacy prospect. And so it was a big move by Rhett Lashley to do it a whole week and a half in advance, I'll add, of that game. And then they spent their two weeks – looking at the offensive line and really trying to figure out where everyone needs to be and what positions they can be in to best help the offense get on track. And then for Rhett Lashley and his staff, they simplified it, I feel like. They went and said, you know what, we're just going to run the football. We're going to stick with it. If eventually they come up and try to load the box, we'll adjust accordingly. But they went into that game against TCU with a mindset that they can out-physical them they knew they probably had a, a good opportunity to do that defensively, but offensively, they needed to to kind of slow things down. New starting quarterback who's got experience, but they really wanted to just go with the ground and pound, control the clock, be physical. They felt like they could do that, and they did. So they they really kind of simplified things. And and I, you know, clearly they they spent their time in the bye week 
uh, well. That offensive line is kind of impressive when you look at it. A lot of uh, power four experience there. Uh, they did do a lot of mixing and matching. You talked about finding guys that fit in the right spots. I mean, I think Justin Osborne's a guy that started at center one game. They flex him back out to tackle. I think Lashley said his home, his future in the NFL is going to be playing on the interior. Sounds like they were able to work that out. Um, PJ Williams is holding down one of the tackle spots. I know Ja'Kai Clark got a little bit nicked up. It uh, sounds like he practiced uh, earlier this week as we talked about this. How impressed have you been with those guys' ability uh, to get integrated into this offense and just how strong has this offensive line been and where's the confidence level uh, of this running attack being able to sustain against a, a rugged front like Florida State? Yeah, like you said, all Power 4 conference transfers, um, every single one of them, including some of the depth guys as well. So there, there are they are guys that are familiar with this level uh, in a sense. You know, you've got Andrew Chambly, who started at left tackle last game. He was an all-SEC freshman at Arkansas. You said P.J. Williams, he's going to be at right tackle. Justin Osborne, right guard. Ja'Kai Clark, 40 games at Miami. Logan Parr came from Texas and was there, you know, right up there in terms of their offensive linemen last year. So a lot of experience in that regard, but – they haven't faced anyone like Florida State over the last year and a half, you know, as a unit. And and even Justin Osborne, he's been here a few years now. Uh, and Rhett Lashley said it today. They have not faced anyone like Florida State. This is probably in my decade plus covering and being, you know, at school at SMU. This is probably the most physically imposing, athletic looking team that will have walked in Ford Stadium since Johnny Manziel and Texas A&M in his first start. Um, which, you know, it's, there's been TCU teams, there's been a couple of Baylor teams, but you know, this is a Florida State team that checks the boxes physically. I think in the run game, SMU will have a shot to run on them. It'll be about everybody doing their job. I know that's cliche, but when you add in the tight ends like Matthew Hibner and RJ Maryland, and you add in, you know, even Kevin Jennings maybe holding some of the the backside guys with with some different, you know, actions and his ability to run a quarterback keeper, all of those things have to come together for them to run the ball. And then when you look at the athletes that Florida State has, they're going to probably be able to put pressure on Kevin Jennings. And, and that's the area where the offensive line has struggled this year in pass protection. But they circled the wagons well against TCU. They didn't give up a sack. I think they gave up maybe one or two pressures. But Kevin's got an ability to move around. That should help. But until you kind of see it, this is another one of those show me games. I think they can run on Florida State. It's just going to be a matter of, what they can do to kind of minimize what should be a pretty pretty lethal pass rush from from the Seminoles. So what's up with Kevin Jennings? He, he can run, but he's not necessarily a runner. Uh, and he's had opportunities to sort of take that job uh, by the horns and, and make it his own. And uh, I guess it maybe it took a little bit of a setback against BYU in that game. But what is it about him that maybe has anything clicked? Uh, were they able to use that bye week to kind of cultivate some stuff around him that makes them feel that it's a a sustainable sort of path forward with him as the quarterback. Yeah, this is a, a really touchy subject around SMU right now in a sense, especially before the TCU game, because Preston Stone was your four-star blue chip, you know, prospect who grew up going to SMU games, grew up right down the street. His dad and family went to SMU. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, unrest uh, when Rhett Lashley decided to make that change and to do it early in a bye week after Preston necessarily didn't do anything to blow up like a Jackson Arnold did over the past week. Uh, but he he just kind of clearly wasn't consistent enough in the games to be the starter. And, and Kevin came in against BYU and moved the offense. They didn't finish in the red zone, had a turnover. Rashard Smith had a fumble. You know, things just didn't come together for them. And that's what really sunk their ship in a sense. But you look back at Kevin Jennings and his his – I believe it's three of his last four starts have been win a state championship, the highest level in Texas high school football, win the AAC championship, lose a heartbreaker to BC, really could have gone either way. And then his latest start is winning the iron skillet for the first time in 21 years or 19 years on SMU's campus. So he's a winner. I know that's kind of a, you know, coach speak type of response yeah. there for Kevin, but he's athletic. He can move around. He does have pop on the ball. Um, he needs to continue to develop his downfield accuracy. I think with this receiver, receiver court, it's kind of been a little, you know, on both sides of it. You know, receivers got to make more competitive plays on the ball. Kevin's got to make some better throws too. But in that short and intermediate passing game, 
he's really able to kind of, you know, cook a little bit, you know, find the slants, find some dig routes. And with this run game, the way it's going, maybe things loosen up, you know, down the field. If, if Florida State wants to kind of sell out, to stop the run, which, you know, with Kevin's kind of uh, lack of, you know, film in terms of pushing the ball down the field, it wouldn't be a bad play. What does it feel like? What's your read on just in terms of his desire to run? Is he a guy that only wants to use that part of his game when it's absolutely necessary? Does it feel like sometimes he maybe bails too early or has he found kind of a good happy medium, do you think? I think Rhett does a good job of moving the pocket a little bit, you know, some different bootlegs and also just uh, the, his touchdown to Jordan Hudson was a great throw, rollout, design, kind of safe third down play when you know you're going to get points. And that's the type of things I think they want to see in the passing game when it comes to him moving around. But about his running, Red is going to run him. He's a tough kid. I mean, he took one hell of a hit uh, from a BYU defender uh, where he basically got body slammed. And Kevin's not the biggest guy in the world, but he popped right up. And, and you know, not to say that can happen every time, but that's the type of player he is. He's, he brings a toughness. He brings uh, a very calm demeanor to this team. And when it comes to his ability to extend plays, he does a really good job keeping his eyes down the field. I think his touchdown pass to Brashard Smith uh, against TCU, where he ex escaped the rush, got out, kind of almost baited the TCU linebackers to come up and popped it to him on, you know, on the money. And he was able to make a couple guys miss and get in the end zone. But those type of plays are so critical. But at the same time, Kevin can run it. I mean, he, he absolutely has the speed. He's got a little wiggle to him. The biggest thing he'll have to do is hold on to the football. That's something he has kind of been, you know, a little plagued with, just a little too loosey goosey there with it. So that's something they're wanting to clean up. But he had that fumble early against TCU, and he bounced back, and uh, they didn't punt the rest of the game after fumbling on his second drive. So he's 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 got an ability to bounce back as well. Run game number super impressive from SMU this uh, part of the season so far, Billy. What what about the passing offense? Just in terms of wide receiver, what level of of athlete, what caliber of athlete do they have out wide right now? Yeah, they have Jordan Hudson, a former five-star receiver who transferred from TCU before last season. And he's got, I mean, in terms of getting off the bus, he's what you want in terms of receiver. Um, he's not, you know, Johnny Wilson or Keon Coleman level, but he physically looks the part. I mean, he looks like kind of a clone of Rasheed Rice, quite honestly, who's SMU's, you know, stud receiver a couple years ago. And then on the other side, you've got Romello Brinson, a former Miami transfer who's super bouncy, athletic. He's kind of finding himself. Uh, and then they rotate in Moochie Dixon, a former Texas transfer, and Keyshawn Smith, another former Miami guy. Those are kind of the four receivers they go with out wide. And then in the slot, Roger Daniels, but especially Jake Bailey. Jake Bailey's really emerged the last few games, making some plays. And then they have RJ Maryland, who's the son of former Miami great and NFL you know, player, Russell Maryland. He's a very, very good tight end. So they've got some weapons. They need to develop a little bit more consistency overall. You're going to see probably a lot of short intermediate passes, but they they had a pretty good you know hit rate on those as of late. All right, looking at the defense right now, uh, you see the way they played against BYU, but then you also see the way they played against TCU. Uh, huge sort of swings on the spectrum just where is this defense right now I guess up front when it comes to you know limiting teams running the ball because at Florida State right now obviously this passing offense is struggling they're going to want to run the ball uh, TCU was not able to run the ball able to throw for 400 yards but it sounded like Rhett was uh, fair or was cool with that sort of trade-off I guess H how's the front been holding up so far for SMU do you think yeah the, the front's been really good uh, you know, quite honestly I mean it, it might without having looked ahead to what's next for Florida State, it might be one of the better defensive lines that the Seminoles will face, you know, just because they have so much depth and guys that, to your point about power four guys on the offense line, this this has Jared Harrison Hunt, uh, Miami guy, Jafari Harvey, a Miami guy, Elijah Roberts, uh, had a heck of a last two games against BYU and, and TCU. And then they also have, you know, a lot of depth. Tank Booker from Arkansas, Mike Lockhart from West Virginia, both of you know, played a ton of football over the course of their careers. Corey Roberson from Oklahoma. It just kind of keeps going, and they've found an ability to to rotate them at a good level where they can all, you know, have consistency. And that's where they're kind of at at this point, which is really, really good in terms of stopping the run. When they're in their lane and they're playing the right way that they want to structurally, 
they're really hard to run on. And, and it starts with the defensive line. And, you know, I think for them, they've done a good job of kind of affecting the pocket at times. They haven't gotten home maybe as much as they want to, but they've done a really nice job kind of affecting quarterbacks. I think, you know, TCU had the big passing day, but quite honestly, it, it wasn't, I don't want to say it was fool's gold when you pass for that many yards, but a lot of double moves, flea flickers. There was one play where SMU didn't even have a play call in and you could tell there was just mass confusion. So, I mean, the game was just out of hand. So they were throwing and throwing and throwing and, and SMU was kind of okay with, I think them making them earn some things too. But uh, I mean, they have a lot to clean up in terms of those double moves and things like that. But when they had just kind of make, you know, make plays on the ball opportunities, that defensive line was able to affect them. And then it helped the secondary, you know, grab a couple of interceptions off of Hoover. What is, what's your take on the cornerbacks right now, uh, specifically Brandon Crossley and, and Jalen Davis Robinson? Yeah. Brandon Crosley is a really competitive guy and, and he's, He's uh, kind of a, on, on the smaller end in a sense, you know, comparatively, especially to FSU's cornerback group. But he is a, a, a big time veteran. He'll make some plays. He'll also probably go pick up a pass interference call. Jalen Davis Robinson is really good against the run. Very physical tackler um, and willing, which is which is a good thing. And that's why they keep him you know, rotating in. He's he's kind of had a little bit of a rough patch coverage wise. And then they've been playing a lot of Deuce Harmon as well, a Texas A&M transfer, uh, who's, again, kind of on the smaller side, but uh, is, is, is able to kind of attack uh, the ball and, and, and has been really strong in coverage overall. But um, when you look at this cornerback room, it's still one that, as we're you know, watching game number five this weekend, we're going to learn a lot about what SMU is going to have you know, the rest of the season because – they did have their moments against TCU where they made plays, but at the same time, you know, they, they, they had a lot of mental errors. So it, it was kind of the question mark unit going into the season on what is an overall strong defense with tons of talent at defensive line, returning experience and talent at linebacker and safety. The, the question was, you know, how would they replace two starters at corner? And, and, and I don't want to say the jury's still out because they've, they've done, better than probably even people expected going in, but it, it still could be a little bit of an adventure this weekend. Two talented safeties in Ahmad Moses and Isaiah Wachobia. Uh, what is the status on Wachobia and just how pivotal, I guess, have those guys been to maybe help and clean up some of the stuff that the cornerbacks haven't been able to keep in front of them? Yeah, Wachobia is good to go. He's the AAC uh, MVP of the championship game. So he's he's got, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, accolades and and he looks like an NFL type of strong safety a Dallas guy who's um, just really matured over the last you know few years since he got to campus and has turned into heck of a leader he wears the J Jerry Levias jersey number 23 which is really special at SMU and then you've got like you said Ahmad Moses two interceptions last week he's he's probably the guy on that defense in the secondary that they were worried about you know teams coming and calling uh, during the portal opportunities um, even though he wasn't in and uh, they were able to hold on to him, and and he's making them look smart for doing that because he's been a stud. He was a late addition, you know, in Rhett Lashley's first signing class. They brought him in, flipped him from U UTSA. He's just a really sound football player, and he's continued to develop. And then they have former Stanford captain Jonathan McGill, who's who had some great tackles against uh, TCU, really made some plays. And I guess he had the flu during the week, too, so he didn't really practice much. And he came out and had one of his best games since being on campus. and then. I'll add that C.J. Sanders might be one of the better nickel guys in this conference. Uh, he's really physical, and he's he took that job and grabbed it and held onto it so hard that they actually moved Brandon Crosley from that nickel spot and moved him out the corner and said, you know what, we're going to get you more snaps this way. Um, he's been really, really good. He had a great tackle again against TCU. All right, winding things down then, uh, Billy, I know this is like a really like an esoteric kind of question, but we've heard so much on the outside about SMU's desire to finally get into power five ball, power four, whatever we're calling it now. Uh, and this is obviously the, the ACC opener for them. Last week, it was Cal coming to Tallahassee. That was Cal's first ACC game. Not sure Berkeley was as juiced up for the news that they were moving conferences as uh, the folks in Dallas were when SMU was able to hop aboard with the ACC. I know Lashley said that they want to play with passion, not emotion. Uh, that's what they tried to do against TCU. Is there possibly more juice in this game than there was last week against TCU? Just how uh, sort of, um, you know, 
excited do you think this fan base and this team is for uh, their first ACC conference game? Yeah, I, I can tell you it is. It's probably the hardest ticket to get that that I've ever kind of been around for SMU football, quite frankly. I mean, this is this is a monster game. I, I think for Seminole fans coming to town, you're going to realize that SMU fans care. They're very excited to be in this conference, as you would expect. But they're also very welcoming. And, and so enjoy that piece of it. This stadium should be you know pretty packed. I mean, that's the expectation. There is actually a little bit of worry on SMU's side of things that you know Seminole fans wouldn't travel, you know, despite the start um, or with the start that they've had. But we're expecting it, it to be kind of electric on campus, you know, with the boulevard and all the ACC huddle crew and, and things like that. So there is a ton of excitement about this game from the fan base. And then when you flip over to the team, they have to find a way to manage that. And and off after a week where everyone is is singing their praises, you know, just after everybody, you know, kind of looking at your downfall, you know, losing to BYU on a Friday night at home. So if there's anything that they can kind of hold on to, you can see how quickly it can be going downhill and everything's going wrong. You can see how quickly it can go back uphill. How you replicate what they did against TCU from an emotion, emotional and passion level is going to be key. They're very excited for the game. I can tell you that it's a huge challenge. I think they know that. And I can't see them taking them lightly, especially with what happened against BYU. Once they see Florida State, and it's kind of, I was at ACC kickoff and, you know, the three guys that, that Coach Norvell brought, I was like, whoa, all right, those are some good looking guys. Those are going to be quite the handful for SMU to, to worry about when, you know, September 28th rolls around. So, but it's, it's about SMU. You know, that's one thing that they've kind of, you know, tried to hone in on as they go about their prep. And I think it finally clicked against TCU because, this is a team that can run the ball if they want to. They play good defense for the most part. And when they're focused and they're not, you know, taking penalties or losing focus and fumbling the ball or, you know, having mental errors in the secondary, they're a pretty sound football team in all three phases. So how do you kind of replicate again what they did against TCU, but clean up some areas? They feel like they'll, you know, have the the team that can do it. It just you know, might have to look a, a certain way to get it done. And as long as you have more points than the other people, it, that's all that matters in, in this game. And, you know, I think that's where this team doesn't really care. And it, it kind of dates back a little bit to last year. They don't care what the final score is. They don't care what it looks like. They maybe lost that a little bit early on this year. And it seems like they found it against TCU and they're going to try to replicate it against Florida State. All right, we'll see how it goes down. SMU hosting Florida State, first ACC tilt for the Mustangs, 8 p.m. Saturday night, ACC Network. Uh, check out everything with SMU over on the On3 website, on theponyexpress.com. Follow Billy on the Bird app as well. Billy, thanks for taking time out, man. Billy Embody from on theponyexpress.com. Football's in full swing, and fall is right around the corner, uh, if not already at our door. Have we, have we hit fall equinox? I don't know. I'm not sure. But fuel up for both with factors, no prep, no mess meals. Meet all of your wellness goals thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factors fresh, never frozen meals. They are dietitian approved and they're ready to eat in just two minutes, everybody. So no matter how busy you are, and we're all busy, I get it. Well, y'all are busy. Y'all have kids and wives and stuff. I don't have either. You're always going to have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals with Factor. So make today the day you start it off and you change it all up with a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? Make every day delicious by treating yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and even blackened salmon. Head to factormeals.com slash wakeup50. Use the code wakeup50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That code is wakeup50 at factormeals.com slash wakeup50. Again, 50% off the first box, 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. I meant to say this earlier. I um, want to you know, give some some more credence to Ira uh, and his sort of his comments and things like that. So couldn't Florida State, can DJ be close, Corey, to, I don't want to say like breaking the dam or, you know, the snowball becoming an avalanche of positivity, but... 
you know, we're just trying to think about what Norvell is obviously kind of processing when he's watching practice, watching game film. And what's the line between we're close and unfortunately this is what we are because this is what bad teams do. Like overthrows, underthrows, guys running the wrong route, drops, things like that. It's just like, you know, if, if Morlock makes a catch, yeah. Who knows how what, what things look like if you if, make if uh, Kaziah Holmes makes a catch against Memphis. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, if, if Lawrence, so I'm sorry, James B. Plug your ears. If Toa Philly makes a catch on the first third down of the first drive yeah. against Boston College, you know, a butterfly effect, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if you make the right read, if you call a better play on that third and 14 or whatever it was on the second drive of the game against Cal and you get two scores in your first, you know, there's there's enough things that have been marginally on the they've been on the cusp of it going their way but it obviously has not uh, over the course of four games I don't know is, is that like a pattern that that's what five and seven teams end up looking like those are the things they do to end up five, five and four. seven well whatever I give my I give my kingdom for <laughs> five and seven at this point or is it fair to kind of look at, at it through a prism that says well you know what if 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 two of the four things that keep going against us bad in a game start going our way we might be able to win a game and be in victory formation. Yeah, I think um, you know th this. No, this offense is this offense and this football team aren't close to being good. But I think this off this offense isn't close to being average. I mean, literally, you'd have to double their point total just to be average. Um, but I do think this. Like I said, I think this offense is close to being mediocre. And that would be more like catching a couple balls. Um, but see, you say about doubling your app, but it's two drives. It's it's the matter of cashing in on two drives that you have in cash. But like, the margin for error, right? Yeah. Like, yes, if everything go, if you, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. Trayshawn Ward dropped a wide open touchdown. Right. If the quarterback lifts his feet up uh, on that scramble on fourth down against Florida State the other night, or third down against Peyton, he walks into the end zone. Like every team has a couple of a three or five or ten plays where they make mistakes and want them back. The margin for error that this team is like they they can't if they make any mistake, the drive is over. Like they don't overcome bad plays. They can't. But but I, the point remains, and I and I and I hear you. Like if 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 they could just eliminate the awful plays, the sacks. Um, the the free rushers that that tackle running backs four yards in the backfield the drops the the wrong route if they if they just played um, smart and did what they were coached to do or I shouldn't say that because that puts too much emphasis on the players if they if they played the way they can and reached their full potential it's still a mediocre offense right it's not like they're this close to being Ohio State they're this close to being Duke. But in this instance, we think the defense could be good enough that being being Duke offensively or being uh, I don't know, man, Boston College offensively. Hey, real quick, what's the last time? When's the last time Florida State allowed thirty points in a regular season game? Well, oh, in a re uh, wasn't any time last year. Uh, Florida game, 22. Florida, yeah, yeah, Anthony Richardson, yeah, Florida twenty-two. Yeah. I mean, that's what you know, Rhett last year was talking about how good the defense is. He said that you know none of the preseason projections on the talent were wrong. That defense, they've got four starters that are going to be in the NFL. They've held teams. I think, I think it's they 16. got more than that, right? Yeah, yeah, probably. He said six. I think he said sixteen regular season games. Uh, it's been since they've allowed twenty-nine or more points. So. Yeah, if this again to your point, sorry to, to knock you off track, but yes, if this defense can continue to, to deliver, not at the level they did against Cal, that was that was you know we're not going to ask that level of production, right. if you will, but something between that and the Memphis games. I mean, Memphis only scored like what twenty, and that was yeah. how much that came off turnovers. What did they give them? They gave yeah, them they have six turnovers. off turnovers. Yeah, so, so, but yeah, so again, yeah, that that was my point is like the defense is good enough that if you just have a a, a below average offense, a mediocre offense, and not horrible. Um, it could, yeah, because let's say Morlock makes that catch at midfield the other day, gets you 25 yards. All right, well, well, okay, maybe you get another first down and kick a field goal. It, it's not like that's a guaranteed touchdown that he dropped. That's and that's not a guaranteed touchdown drive. It's a critical drop. I'm not, uh, you know, abstaining. I'm not telling he's abstained from making that mistake, but um, well, it's abstain is probably not the right word. But uh, it, it at least gets you maybe three points. Absolved. Absolved. There you go. It uh, it at least gets you three points, probably, maybe. You know, they 
they don't have a lot of chances for big plays. So when they do, Keziah Holmes in the flat, Morlock over the middle, um, Williamson dropping what would have been a, a first, a third down conversion. Um, you know, those those are the those are the killers. So if they erase all that, that's great. It probably averages. It probably ends up averaging maybe seven more points a game. But you give yourself a chance with seven more points, I guess. That's what's so concerning about where they are as a whole is it's not like they've missed they've dropped 21 touchdowns. They've dropped some pl- they've dropped some balls and made some mistakes, but it, they're not close to being good. They are close to being better. And I think that's what we kind of saw against Cal is they they did show they had 208 yards at half. They had 104 yards rushing. Like it looked like a real offense again. Yeah, they only had 7 points. That's a bummer. That's not great. Not ideal. But your coach gave away three points by calling a pass play on third and 18, your coach and your quarterback. And then you had another – I don't remember what else happened. But they had had nice drives. They had a couple of nice drives in the first half. And then when they were down, least lest we forget, they did go and drive 70 yards for a touchdown or 80 yards for a touchdown. So there is – there's enough to give you a little bit of hope. Like we talked about on the headlines. That throw from DJ to Ja'Kai, man. That's as that's as pretty a throw as anybody's going to make all season. That is a yep. dime to a small window with the game on the line. I forgot that was a third down. So Wasn't there another third down conversion on that yeah, drive too. That was the one where I think Jakai intercepted it. It was right. gonna, it was intended for Morlock and he intercepted it. Uh, but that throw to Jakai for the touchdown is a dime, and that was third and six or third and nine. And if you don't get it, yeah, you're in field goal range. But Fitzgerald's got to kick a 53 or 54 yarder to give you the lead. I mean, that was a money throw at a money moment. Um, so there is some stuff in there. He did that with Benson against Georgia Tech. Like, But it's just – it's not all coming together and clicking in a way that gets anybody excited. Yeah, because, again, like to your point, I guess countering back to the point I was trying to make, and I wasn't necessarily trying to make it, but just some kind of food for thought. I mean, there are some things that are going their way. That throw to, to Ja'Kai was perfect. I mean, I don't know how many times – DJ could replicate that in that moment, but in that moment he did it. So that's awesome. And then obviously maybe that throw wasn't ideally supposed to go to Jakai beforehand on that third down conversion, but it went their way. Huge conversion. Yeah. And then you, you had it. You, uh, you listen, I mean, I know we were kind of spoiled with what Ryan Fitzgerald is and there still is, you know, the whole college kicker meme or what have you, you know, their, their kicker missed. Well, I mean, he missed a 35 and a 40 and a 37 yard field goal. Um, yeah, you know, like I don't know how many times you can count on that as well to keep you in games. But didn't did he smoke like a fifty-one yarder right down the pipe? I thought uh, his field goals were made from the seven-yard line. Or no, that is where the drive ended. Yeah, so it was twenty-four yards, uh, thirty-eight yards, and oh yeah, he hit a fifty-yarder. No kidding, really. All right, good for him. But he yeah, I, I'm sure he felt good on the plane going back. <laughs> Guys, what do you want me to do? I scored all our points. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to do a mailback show tomorrow, but we'll probably end up breaking it up into two uh, just because we won't have a live show this week, everybody. So if you're still listening and you're on YouTube, uh, in the comment section, post a question. Maybe we'll, we'll, maybe we'll grab like the, the three best out of the YouTube comments mm. and uh, sprinkle them into the mailbag. Should we do the over-unders right now, Corey? You want to save that for tomorrow? You've had a long day. I want to yeah, let's save it for tomorrow, buddy. Let's save okay. it for tomorrow. Yeah, so we'll, we'll tack that on the one of the, the mailbag shows. We're going to go to practice. It's probably going to be a beautiful day, which is like the cruel irony of these these hurricanes. Yeah. I always think of, when this stuff happens, I always just think about, you know, Cro-Magnon, man, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, tens of, yeah, ten thousands of years ago, um, where it's like, yeah, like, oh, this is great today. What a great, we've had a great stretch, haven't we, Sally? Yeah. Like, just weeks of beautiful weather. And then the next day, like a hurricane blows through and just like wipes out the tribe or whatever. And he's like, what is, yeah, he's like, what is this? Sally, yeah. where is Sally? Like yeah. he's, cause Sally just got blown away. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. All right. We'll keep our fingers crossed for a, uh, a wobble. Uh, and then it just dissipates and hits nobody. I don't want to like, I'm not, it's always weird too. It's like, I don't want to root. For, you, you want to, you don't want to root. Miss, yeah. yeah. You want Let's to just hope you. it hits live Oak. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody's saying that we don't want that either. Right, we don't right. want it to hit anybody. Yeah, just just dissipate. Go away, Helene. You've, you've got your name out there. You've got your 15 minutes now. Go away. Right. Uh, we'll be at practice the Royal We. Uh, so check out interviews, practice footage, and the like over at WarChant.com. Jeff Cameron show one to four o'clock. I would imagine uh, he's going strong, and uh, we're always up at WarChant.com for you folks. So go jump in, get involved in the conversation. Tag me or Corey in a thread. Maybe we'll reply, or we'll just reply to your mailbags. 
He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening to Wake Up War Chant, presented by Vitamin Energy.